Hello everyone and welcome to the ANSPA Risk and Employee Shore webinar. We are pleased to welcome our presenters for today, Anthony Black, Jenny Back, Tariq Nasri and Julie Glynn. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to post questions to the presenters throughout the presentation. If you are experiencing any technical issues during this webinar, please dial our support team on 1800 733 416. This number is also listed in the chat box. I'd now like to pass you over to Jenny to begin. Good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jenny Bax and I'm the State Manager for New South Wales and the ACT, ACT here at ANZA Insurance. My fellow presenters today will be Tariq Nasri, Senior Employment Relations Advisor at Employee Shore, and Anthony Black, Senior Risk Solutions Consultant at ANZA. I want to thank you all for making the time to dial into our webinar today. Um, today I'm going to be sharing with you some details on ANSPAR's risk management solutions and then introduce the new strategic risk partnership we've entered into with EmployShaw. Tarek will take you through legal compliance and then discuss some proactive ways to manage your staff. Importantly, he will show you how to identify red flags in your client's business and how to prevent employment practice liability claims. You will hear about expert employment practice services available to your clients and why overall risk strategy is so important. Finally, we will have a question and answer session, so please send your questions through to the chat box at any time during the presentation and Anthony will collate them for further discussion. Anspire Risk Solutions sits under three distinct banners. Enterprise Risk Management, which is the first one you see, which includes consultancy and workshops. A suite of tailored programs are available, facilitated by our expert consultants with specialist sector knowledge and experience. These include risk and governance consultancy, advice and training, risk maturity assessment, risk improvement planning, strategic risk identification programs, strategic board and executive workshops, and business continuity. Our online packages are tailor specific sector-specific software packages available on desktop, tablet and app, app, app platforms. We have three packages available. Learn, which is e-learning modules that enable organisations to create and deliver online induction and training courses for employees and contractors. Incident, which is an intuitive process that enables staff, contractors and volunteers to report an incident or issue online as soon as it occurs and then enables the organisation to manage the incident right through the quality cycle. An audit. Any regular plan, tasks such as audits and fire inspections can be scheduled and tracked in the system with notification and alerts delivered to the appropriate responsible person. A risk partnership offers specialist risk advice and online tools to organisations. We have risk quality surveys that encapsulates the traditional site survey process for property and liability risks, along with the use of drone technology together with, LATO, with, together with lasers, which enables identification of targeted and specific information that supports good risk management decision making. Our online risk education hub provides simple sector relevant tools and fact sheets to help the prioritisation and management of risk. Under the Risk Partnership Banner, you can see that ANSBAR has partnered with EmployShore, Australia's leading workplace relations specialist who will be providing ANSBAR clients with expert employment practice services. Our partnership with EmployShore offers a risk management value add to the management liability policy holders, both existing and new, aimed at reducing your clients' employment practices, liability claims and excess. When you are part of the ANSAR community, you automatically have access to our free advice line and will receive guidance from an employment practice specialist. EmployShore's advisory team will be on hand during business hours, ensuring best practice and procedural fairness is followed when dealing with employment practice such as bullying and resignation. This service provides immediate human contact to help your clients resolve difficult or sensitive business issues and has a strong evidence of base of claims reduction. EmployShore already offer this service, service to over 16,000 SMEs nationally and have offices all over Australia. So what are the benefits for this service for yourself? Any ANSAR client who has a management liability policy 
will have their excess reduced to $1,000 for any employment practice liability claim for if they follow the practice below. Call the advice line before embarking on any action regarding employee related issues. The experienced and dedicated team at EmployShore will ensure the client's actions and processes are in line with procedural fairness requirements and support the client with relevant documentation. Provided the client follow and enact the advice provided to them along the way, the standard excess will decrease to $1,000 for each and every claim. If the process is not followed by the client and a claim is put forward, the standard excess which will apply, which is currently sitting at $5,000. Did you know that 86% of small business employees don't fully understand their obligations under the Fair Work Act? Getting it wrong can be costly and stressful for them. I'd now like to introduce Tariq from EmployShore who will discuss the Fair Work Act, proactive ways to managing your staff, how to identify red flags in your client's business, and the key ingredients to help prevent employment practice liability claims. So good morning everyone. I guess for today what I'd like to focus on is key areas of risk and ways which those risks can be mitigated through I guess correct documentation and general awareness of the legal requirements and processes as far as the employment framework in Australia is concerned. What I'd like to start with are four questions. Now these questions are based on common I guess stereotypes or myths in the workplace. Um, which I'd like to start a poll on each one and get your responses for, then we can take it from there. So I'll start with the first one. You need three warnings before you can terminate. True or false? Okay. All right, we'll stop the poll there and we'll have a quick discussion about that result. So. From the results of the first poll, it looks like the majority of us feel that you need three warnings before you can terminate. So the answer to this question is a little bit of a trick question. The answer to that is no, you actually do not need three written warnings before you can terminate. The current requirements of the Fair Work Act or any other you know, legislative document don't actually prescribe any specific requirement for three written warnings. However, unless you've got a very serious situation which require, you know, for example, serious misconduct, um, there's a lot of case law which demonstrates that you know you probably should have some type of warning process in place. However, that's on a case by case basis as well. So the real answer to this question is technically no. However, again, as a good example of how ambiguous employment law can be, there is you know there is still that requirement there based on individual circumstances. So moving on to the second question. So you can terminate someone on the spot for serious misconduct. What about what are our thoughts? All right. Well, I'll stop the poll there. This one is an overwhelming uh, truth. So everyone agrees that well, majority of people agree that you can terminate someone on the spot for serious misconduct. The answer to that one is no. Now. A little bit of a, again, similar to the first one, you know, logically speaking, if I have an employee who punches another employee in the workplace, you'd obviously be saying, well, you know, that's your job gone. And yes, that is the case. However, if you were to terminate someone on the spot, the requirements for unfair dismissal is that first and foremost, you have a valid reason for termination, but secondly, that you followed a valid process. So you can still, you know, uh, fall victim to an unfair dismissal claim even when your employee, for example, is engaged in gross misconduct if you don't follow the process when terminating them. So you can terminate, obviously, for serious misconduct, but you know the, um, the clients need to be aware that there's a process for that. So if somebody does that in the workplace, sure, you know, stand them down, run through a disciplinary process, and go through the requirements prior to termination. Otherwise, it's just um, opening the doors for a claim. So the third one, if an employee does not hit KPIs, you can terminate them. What are our thoughts?
Okay, I'll stop the poll there. So all of us think that if an employee does not hit KPIs, um, you can terminate them. So this one really, you know, they probably need a little bit more information, but the answer to this one actually is yes. If they don't hit the KPIs, you can terminate them provided you've gone through what we refer to as that performance management process. So depending on the size of your business or the client's businesses, um, how many employees they've got, all these things will be factored into consideration. If they've given somebody two or three weeks, two or three months, for example, to improve their performance, they've gone through clearly established KPIs, the individuals are able to perform it, they've provided this required support and training, and they're still not meeting those KPI requirements, um, if they've given adequate notice through that, that it does create grounds um, to terminate. However, that being said, also correct in that if I've got their 50 employees and I one, run one performance management process and they don't hit their KPIs, you probably can't terminate. It's more about, again, going through the correct process, which is, I guess, the theme across all of these um, questions. So the final one, you can terminate someone via text. What are our thoughts? Cool, so I'll stop the poll there. So again, majority of us think that you cannot terminate someone via text, uh, which is um, actually quite pleasing to see because techni technically you can, but I always recommend you don't. So with um, termination via text message, you can do that provided you've gone through the requisite procedural requirements. So provided you've had a, the correct meetings, um, you know, if the final outcome is advising them on termination, the, the, um, the Fair Work Act or the regulations don't actually pres prescribe a specific way um, of how you're meant to notify someone of termination. You can do it verbally, you can do it by email, can, but the preference, of course, is always to do it in person, at the very least via a phone call. But that being said, um, you know, it uh, doesn't mean you can't do it, which is interesting because, you know, the last questions we looked at, how strictly they apply, various requirements and for something like a text message, you know, they're really blasé about it. So again, it's one of those which there's a lot of ambiguity around it. So thank you very much for your participation in that. We'll talk more uh, broadly about, I guess, the framework in Australia now. So in terms of what the Australian legal employment law framework looks like, we start with the Fair Work Act. So this um, was introduced by the Labor government under Kevin Rudd. It overtook the uh, work choices, which was introduced by the Howard government, and has been in place since then, since 2009. So this is the federal document in Australia which covers all uh, private enterprises and businesses and corporations, or anyone defined as a constitutional corporation under the Constitution. Um, so that is our starting point for everything. The, the second um, industrial instrument we then refer to is the modern awards. So at the moment there's about 122, 123 modern awards which apply to various industries and, um, yeah, industries and sectors across Australia. Almost in all likelihood your business is going to be covered by a modern award. So if the clients are, for example, in an industry, um, they're in blue collar work or you know, they may be professional services, they may be non-for-profits, almost all likelihood they may fall under a modern award. So if they currently aren't aware of it, that's probably a good, good starting point they should review. Modern awards get their power or derive their power from the Fair Work Act, so they carry the exact amount of authority as the Fair Work Act. However, where there is a contradiction between the two, if it's in favour of the employee, they will refer to the Fair Work Act. If it's in favour of the employee under the modern award, the modern award will prevail. For the majority of the time, you find the Fair Work Act is more generous. The third tier is enterprise agreements. So these are private collective agreements which are formed between employer and employees in the workplaces. Um, they're very common in industrial uh, businesses and effectively, without going into too much detail, it's the employer and employees agree on terms and conditions in the workplace. They go through a process and they arrive at an agreement that these terms and conditions will bound our employment relationship, such as you know terms and conditions of employment, types of employment, hours of work and wages. And finally, the most basic 
and the one we all have is the contract of employment. Contract of employment can be written, they can also be verbal or they can be implied via conduct. So just because you have someone working for you for two years and they don't sign a contract doesn't mean the contract's not in place. It can be enforceable by impl implied behaviour. If you're continuing to come to work, you're paying them a wage, there's a, you know, effectively in the traditional sense of contract in place. Now it's not a legal obligation to have a contract, but you know, further on in the slides we'll go through reasons why you should have one as far as certainty of employment ambiguity and reducing risk in the workplace in view of recent cases and decisions. So the National Employment Standards. So we just mentioned the Fair Work Act as the, I guess, the founding principle for employment law in Australia. These 10 basic entitlements uh, are derived from the Fair Work Act. They apply to every single employee across Australia. And a lot of them are quite common. So even though you may not be you know, structured under the National Employment Standards, almost everyone's heard of them. So maximum weekly working hours is 38. You, you know, you cannot work more, or you can, but ordinary hours is 38. Depending on the award you're covered by or your contract of employment, if someone works more than 38, then you know, different terms and conditions apply. Request for flexible working arrangements, you know, um, uh, parents, Elderly people, carers, they have uh, the ability to request flexible working arrangements under the Act. Parental leave and related entitlements, annual leave, personal carers leave, community service leave, long service leave, public holidays, notice of termination, redundancy pay, and number 10, this one's a big catch, provision of a fair work information statement. So this is a document which is meant to be provided to employees upon commencement of employment. A lot of employers, particularly small businesses, or not necessarily even small businesses, just aren't aware of it. Um, and the Commission doesn't do a very good job of requiring, uh, not notifying employees that they should be aware of it. So that's a big one there. That it's, it's available online and it's easy to provide. So if your clients currently aren't aware of it, that's something they need to do because it actually is in breach of the National Employment Standards and, and it's such a simple measure to correct. But most of the people have heard of these or are in receipt of these. And if someone is not receiving these, it's in breach of the obligation. The national minimum wage, the 1st of July every year, the federal minimum wage increases based on what the full bench of the Fair Work Commission determines as a reasonable increase. So this year it was 3.5%. I think last year it was 3.3%. So we've had pretty big increases the last two years. Um, the Commission basically makes that decision based on economic situations, among other, other things, um, and they get also get information from the um, ABS and other, other areas to make that decision. So, but what it means for employers specifically is that if you're covered by an award, your rate of pay will go up as of the first, for first full pay period July every single year. So, for example, 1st of July this year, it went up to $18 and 93 cents, which equates to that much per year, sorry, per week. Um, and the casual loading has remained the same at 25%. Now, for businesses who pay as per the award and aren't aware of this, as of the first full pay period every year, if they haven't increased their wage, wage rate, um, they're effectively underpaying. Now, the longer that goes on, the bigger their liability increases with respect to underpayment. The other thing to watch out for for the national minimum wage is that the 3.5% isn't always just on the base rate of pay, it's also on the base rate on allowances. So for example, if you've got a percentage based allowance, for example, you know, your first aid allowance of 15% based on the um, standard rate under the award, because the standard rate is going up, the applicable allowance which is based on the percentage of the standard rate is also going to go up. So you're also missing out on those key allowances. So that's a big watch out coming, you know, to the 1st of July every year. So, I mean, the way I like to advise clients on this is similar to how you look after your accounts come the financial year for tax purposes, you should also have your eye on this because, you know, your tax may be great, but what happens if you're, you know, carrying a liability of underpayment? So, yeah, that's for the national minimum wage. I mean, you can go deeper into that, but that's just a top level view. Right, so I guess this is trailed on to what I was saying before with respect to risk of underpayment. Now, you've got two regulatory bodies in Australia at the moment for employment law. I'm not looking at the state system, this is just federally at the moment. 
You've got the ombudsman, ombudsman which is the regulator. So ombudsman primarily looks at underpayments um, and uh, breaches of the Fair Work Act or the modern awards um, with respect to wages or even general penalty breaches such as not providing a Fair Work information statement. Then you've got the tri tribunal, which is the Fair Work Commission, which deals with cases, disputes, um, disagreements. So in terms of the data put provided by the Fair Work Ombudsman, so far they've recovered $30.6 million for over 17,000 employees. In 2016, 2017, the Ombudsman investigated 26,917 requests for assistance. So we've got a large number of employees um, proactively approaching the Ombudsman themselves. So it's not always the Ombudsman doing the audit. It's the majority of the time it's going to be the employees of the clients who approach the Ombudsman. And approaching them is actually very easy. It's an email or it's a phone call and there's someone on the, on the other end of the line to basically provide them with the advice. Now, it's a big watch out because the, what the Ombudsman tells your employees or the client's employees is subject to the information they give them. So if you're giving inaccurate information, the employees will walk away with that inaccurate information, then you try and use it against their employer, which just happens on a daily basis for our clients here at Employee Shore. Um, which we then help to obviously rectify based on actual factual information. Um, but yeah, I mean, I won't go through them more, but you can have a read of those. The Ombudsman is very, very proactive. I mean, you may have heard of in the last two years, 7-Eleven, Caltex, Domino's, Pizza Hut. I mean, the whole uh, amendment to the Fair Work Act for vulnerable workers, um, for, you know, franchisee, franchise or obligations came about as a result of those cases. So it's... Um, a lot of people think that, oh, you know, I'm not going to be audited, but the a fair work um, audits are random. You know, they can go as into, you know, NARA or LithGo or or they can come really into the CBD uh, based on where they feel that there is potential breaches. So it's one to always be on the lookout for. So going into the type of claims that your clients need to be aware of. The most common one is unfair dismissal. Um, I mean, I'll mention each of them briefly, but it's unfair dismissal, adverse action discrimination, and bullying and harassment. Now, a key takeaway with unfair dismissal is the eligibility to bring this type of a claim is subject to the size and scale of your client's businesses. So if they have 14 or less employees, an employee can bring a claim for unfair dismissal after 12 months of service. If you have 14 or more employees, um, they can bring it up to six months of service, which is funny because a business with 15 employees and a business with 1,000 employees, the threshold is exactly the same. So that's something they need to be aware of. What it actually means is that an, if an employee brings an unfair dismissal claim, they're effectively saying that they'll terminate for reasons which are considered to be harsh, unjust, or unreasonable. So we're not looking at unlawful termination here, for example, termination because somebody is of a specific gender or whatever else it may be. It's purely because it was harsh, unjust, or unreasonable. Now, the criteria for that is quite broad, and it's really derived from case law, but the takeaway for clients is if you're going to terminate somebody, first of all, understand is it serious misconduct or general misconduct? Do you have the correct disciplinary procedure in place in your policy handbook and are employees aware of that? And secondly, if it's general misconduct, do not treat it as serious misconduct, go through the warning process. Now, if you've got for example, six employees and your employees being there for eight months, you know, that process is going to be a lot, I guess, more straightforward because they haven't got access to unfair dismissal, so you can effectively have one meeting and move them on subject to there being no other risk to be aware of. Or if somebody for two years, um, you know, you need to then treat it a little differently without going into too much detail. So from that example, you can see that there's a lot of ambiguity and there's different trigger points for different types of matters which we will be able to assist them with based on the information that they provide us so that they can make the right decision to reduce the risk for their businesses. Now the second one is adverse action. Oh, sorry, before I go into adverse action, with unfair dismissal, as far as risk, actual risk is concerned, the worst case scenario is six months of wages if it goes, for example, to arbitration. So six months of wages, so if an employee is, for example, on $100,000 a year, they'll get half that as a worst case scenario or if the commission sees fit, a uh, reinstatement of employment. So that is um, the worst case for scenario. So imagine you've spent you know, $25,000, $30,000 defending your arbitration at the Fair Work Commission 
then the commission is like, well, I consider it to be harsh. Now we're not going to reinstate this employee. I mean, I, in a formal life, when I was in a different time, I was in transport. That's what actually happened to me. And believe me, it's not something. Um, it's not a good look because that employee is back in your workplace, and um, it, it impacts culture severely. Aside from the financial cost, which is of course significant. So that's for unfair dismissal. Now, adverse action discrimination. Um, this claim is also very common, and it's different to unfair dismissal in that it looks at um, the employee needs to demonstrate that. Well, sorry, the employee needs to demonstrate that any action taken against an employee is for any other reason other than a protected trait. So we're now looking at matters of discrimination. We're now looking at matters of an employee exercising a workplace right or freedom of association, which is the right to join or not join a union. This risk, this claim is a little less um, constant than unfair dismissal, but the risk is higher because the damages for an adverse action or discrimination claim are uncapped. So there is no ceiling on it, subject to what the Commission or the small claims of the Federal Court or the Federal Circuit Court uh, deem to be appropriate in the circumstances, assuming it gets to that level. The other thing to be aware of is that an employee can bring an adverse action claim even prior to becoming an employee. If they're not happy with the recruitment process and they feel like it's, it's uh, discriminatory in any type of way, they can lodge a general protections claim. There is no threshold or you know criteria for them to uh, meet before they can bring this type of claim. And the onus is, is on your client to demonstrate that their conduct or their action they took was for any other reason other than a protected trait. So if they terminate somebody, uh, let's just say it's a genuine termination, they haven't gone through a fair process. Let's just say the person is of um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander um, origin, and that person feels that they were terminated for that reason. Let's just say that that, the, that wasn't the reason, there were performance issues. But that was never properly communicated, or there was no proper meetings, or no KPI set, there was no process in place based on the policies and procedures. If it goes to an adverse action claim, they really have no case to defend. So even though they're in their in their minds, or you know, they're conscious they did, you know, they felt like doing the right thing, they cannot defend it against that type of claim. So there they get stuck, which is a very common issue, because they can't demonstrate process, the valid reason, or any other thing other than the fact that this person is off, you know. Um, yeah, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. Now, um, origin. Now, that's quite an extreme example, but that's just to showcase, um, you know, how it can work. Now, that's the second one. Now, the third one is bullying and harassment. Now, this one uh, encompasses more of a workplace health and safety view, um, and the requirements for this at the outset isn't necessarily financial, but if the correct action isn't taking place, it's then referred to work, safe work or work safe. Um, and they can investigate further, and penalties can be applied for breaches of the bullying and harassment obligations, particularly if the employer is not proactive. The key takeaway for bullying and harassment is you need to be proactive to mitigate the risks of this. So if you've got an employee approach you and say, you know, this person I feel is like bullying and harassing me, sometimes the appropriate response is we'll tell them no, and if they do it again, come let me know. But if someone says this person just touched me on the leg, that's probably not one where you're going to say say no next time. That's probably one year where you probably need to take more of a proactive approach. So it's you know it's a judge on a case by case basis, and I'll, we'll go through an example later on about where a business was actually fined because they effectively took that approach. Someone advised them of potential sexual harassment um, allegation, and they effectively said you know say no next time. That's probably not good enough. You know again, this is where the workplace health and safety obligations tie into that. Now, if you get that type of a claim, you're required to respond within seven days, and the response effectively needs to outline, um, you know, your response to the bullying harassment complaint. Just before I move on, with that, to give some assurance to that, reasonable management direction is not bullying and harassment. If you try and discipline an employee based on reasonable grounds, performance, you know, performance management, someone based on reasonable grounds, ask for meetings, those types of things are obviously not considered, you know, uh, bullying and harassment. Although the employee may try and claim it, you just need to demonstrate the reasonable process, but also reason for it, um, because otherwise you'd never be able to manage. Um, everything would be bullying and harassment. So those are the three uh, watch out for clients. And um, yeah, I guess the takeaway for that is not doing anything is probably the worst thing they can do. Or not even being aware, being aware of the trigger point is also the worst thing that they can do as far as risk is concerned. So. 
at the very top level, potential liabilities, um, and again, this data is drawn from the Fair Work Ombudsman, but in the last year, 33,000 applications were received by the Fair Work Commission. 26,000 complaints were dealt with by the Fair Work Ombudsman. Now, what I'd like to highlight here is these are two separate bodies. The Ombudsman deals with underpayments and things such as like that, underpayments, breaches of awards, allowances, um, non-payment of entitlements and termination, for example. Applications to the Fair Work Commission are, for example, your general adverse action claims, discrimination claims, bullying and harassment claims, unfair dismissal claims. So that's more accurately just over 50,000. Uh, well, I should say, yeah, more close to 60,000. So you need to combine those two um, complaints. We went through to the Ombudsman and the Commission. Now, eight in 10 employees have experienced bullying. Now, not eight in 10 employees aren't going to complain to you about bullying. So this is one where you need to be mindful of your workplace culture and trends or issues where you may see in the workplace, particularly if the individuals are isolated or if there's ongoing behaviours in the workplace. Because a key note for bullying is that it's re repetition of behaviours. If I go to somebody and I swear at them once and I walk away, that's not bullying, that's harassment. But if I do that every single day, well, now it's going to become bullying. Um, Yeah, and moving on to the next one, one of five employees have experienced sexual harassment and one of three have experienced racism. So again, these employees aren't going to come, you know, and raise an issue every single time this happens for various reasons, but the fact that it's there means that one day one of these issues will arise. So policy procedures and knowing how to respond to it will be paramount. Which takes us on to this point, contracts and policies. So the key difference is, as with contracts, they're you know, um, legally enforceable terms as a contract, like any other contract you make, enforcing expectations and confirms terms and conditions of employment. Now the same common law principles you have with ordinary contracts, you know, intention, agreement, consideration, enforceability, illegality in form, um, capacity to enter into a contract, all those terms which would deem an uh, ordinary contract voidable or reputable remain the exact same for an employment contract. The principles are the same. Um, so for example, if uh, the, you know, a fair, the modern award, for example, has, say, the hourly rate is $25, and if you enter an agreement to pay $20, or if your client does that, say, oh, look, we'll enter into contract, we'll get an agreement, we'll just pay below the award, that will never be enforceable for the reason that it's not, the terms of the contract are not legal. You can't enter into a legal contract like any other contract um, in any, I guess, walk of life. So it's important to be aware that you cannot contract out of legal obligations, but you can include in your contracts things which otherwise would not be protected under the law. So that's your contract of employment. Now, as previously mentioned, um, you're not required to have them, or they're not required under the law to have them, but our recommendation is that all they should absolutely have them. Because it removes ambiguity and it ensures certainty and a perfect example of that is recently we've had a case, um, well there was a case in the commission with respect to um, a casual employee um, who worked I think for two, three years. Um, he, you know, there was no contract of employment in place. There was nothing to find that he really got a casual loading. However, when it went to the commission, um, it was deemed that based on the nature of how he was engaged, the ongoing work, he was actually a permanent part-time employee. So in, in that situation, having a document may not necessarily have saved that client from having to you know, back pay annual leave and other entitlements, but at the same time, it would have added the actual level, level of certainty to demonstrate to the commission that we're well and truly aware of how we're engaging this individual. With respect to policies, this is your, I guess, company playbook or your business, um, you know, rules and regulations. You determine what your policies and procedures are. You do not require your employees' agreement to amend the policies and procedures. And as part of the terms of their contract, there should be determined there that they agree to abide by their policies and procedures in your workplace. So this is your starting point to regulate the culture in, in your workplace. So often a lot of clients they see this as a tick box or a, um, you know, yep, we've got it and put on the bench. But you can effectively use policies to dictate how you want to manage your culture in the workplace. But also what the rules are. If I've got a policy and procedure with respect to use of mobile phone in the workplace, but I never make employees aware of that policy, 
the Commission will never allow me to enforce that policy without making employees first aware of it. So I guess in terms of from a very blanket view, make sure your policy is aligned with what you want to enforce, communicate those, and then enforce it consistently um, for your staff. Because if you don't, it's, you're never going to be able to bring a policy you know, retrospectively and say, oh, but they breached this policy. The Commission is going to ask, well, when have you actually um, enforced this? When have you provided this to employees that they're aware of these standards and expectations in the workplace? The other key difference between contracts and policies is contracts, because it is a legally um, enforceable document, you require a mutual agreement to vary the terms of a contract. So never put in your contract terms which you want to have be able to amend without consultation or without agreement in the future. So if you put, for example, in there um, a clause with respect to bonus, for example, or a commission scheme which you'd prefer to be more flexible, if you said you'll get a commission of 15%, in your contract, well, you're never going to be able to change that without the employee's agreement. Whereas if you have it as a side agreement or as separate to the contract, that gives you more flexibility because you can add further terms and conditions to it. Same with policies and procedures. Whilst you, of course, need to consult if you're going to change, consultation doesn't require an employee's agreement. It's more about making them aware of the change, what the change means for them, and when that change will come into place. They can, of course, respond to that but provided you have responses to their concerns, their responses don't automatically create grounds for you not to roll out any, any changes. So in other words, this, this is your starting point. This is your bread and butter because your contracts will underpin um, what the required rates of pay are, what the modern awards should be, and what uh, any other legal certainty you require. And then your policies and procedures is then for you, for you to regulate your employment relationship. In the absence of that, how do you then fall back onto anything? The employees, it's the biggest loophole for employees to say, well, I was never told, I was never given training. It's, you know, it's so easy for them to do. And if you can't demonstrate this, then unfortunately that's what the Commission or the Ombudsman will accept. So, I mean, I probably should have clicked next, but this is effectively, I mean, everything I just spoke about. So if you're looking at contracts, managers risk, certainty, compliance, protection against claims, protection for you. Your employees, setting expectations, enforcing expectations, influencing morale, and improved productivity and efficiency. So the, I guess the message to clients is, or what we can also speak to them about is, use your documents to your advantage. Rather than as a compliance measure, use it as an actual a strategic measure to manage culture in your workplace. So mitigating your risk. So this is what I was talking about before with respect to the bullying and harassment issue. So this comes from a particular case where an employee made a complaint to her manager about a colleague's inappropriate behavior, which included touching her leg and repeatedly asking her to go for a drink. Now the complainant initially asked her manager to leave her to handle the situation. The manager, as requested, did not take action. The employer was still found liable for $25,000 in damages. Now, unfortunately for this employer, which is, could have happened to any one of our clients, they think they've done the right thing. They haven't tried to skirt process or, um, you know, negate their responsibilities. They re respected the decision of their employee. However, as mentioned, for instances of uh, bullying and harassment, it goes beyond the Fair Work Act, and now you're looking at also your workplace health and safety obligations. If somebody's raising a complaint of that severity, as the manager, irrespective of what that individual wants, you probably need to do a little bit more. And that falls back onto your policy and procedures. You know, you should have a grievance investigation process. If I was the manager in this instance, I'd, I'd, I'd actually be speaking to my employee and saying, look, you know, whilst I appreciate you wanting to, you know, handle this situation yourself, given the severity of what you've raised with me, I take to, this, you know, I'm very concerned. This is what I propose we do. I can look at this informally or formally, but my preference is for me to now step in because given what you've told me, I'd prefer not for you to have individual contact uh, by yourself. Um, and had they done that, they wouldn't have been paying $25,000, long story short. So it's one of those things where, from, I guess, uh, from their perspective, they did the right thing, but unfortunately, what, thinking what the right thing is isn't always the right thing when it comes to workplace obligations. And I guess in terms of the other thing I'll add to that is that's basically something that the advice team will be able to assist with. So if someone, one of your clients comes across an issue like that, you know, that's, we advise, give over 5,000 pieces of advice on a weekly basis, and without doubt, I could say that's probably makes up part of it.
issues like that. So in terms of nav navigating a changing landscape and what you need to be aware of, I'd like to focus on my final slide where there's frequent changes to the employment law framework in Australia. So as mentioned, every year the annual minimum wage increases, but subject to what industry you're in, there can be individual specific increases to your wage rates as well. I mean, a common one is um, the real estate industry award that, um, and start of this year, that award, term and conditions of that award drastically changed, and that was outside the normal 1st of July increase. Another good example, which we'll go into um, when we come to the third point, actually I'll save that one for the third point, but that's obviously the big one. The second one is changes to the Fair Work Act. The perfect example of this um, would be, well, I mean, the Fair Work Act then gave powers to change. I mean, it sort of touched base with both of them. But um, in modern awards and the Fair Work Act, you now re are required to provide domestic leave. Now, that's not specifically entered into the Fair Work Act, but under every modern award, um, there is a requirement for domestic leave now, which wasn't there up until a month ago. As of the 1st of October 2018, which was just yesterday, employee, casual employees, under basically all modern awards who have more than 12 months of service and who can demonstrate that they're regular and systematic can now approach their employers and seek permanent full-time or part-time employment. And now you've got however many um, employers we have in Australia who are now effectively going to have casual permanent employment. Now it's on the employers to then demonstrate that, um, you know, that they actually don't have permanent work available or for any other reason, they need to provide legitimate business grounds. Now, if you weren't aware of these upcoming changes, you're not really prepared for them. Whereas if you know they're coming, whether you agree with it or not is really a byproduct because there's not much, um, and aside from lobbying and advocacy, which happens in the background, as the employer and your focus is on your business, you know, you need to be preparing for these changes. Um, and those are just, you know, very basic examples. Um, domestic violence leave and casual, casual, which has just happened over the last two, three months. And um, yeah, and finally, new changes to codes of practice. That's more specific to workplace health and safety. Um, workplace health and safety and, and employment law, um, it's like the, the legislation is alive. It so always reacts to changing circumstances, um, and it's always important to be on top. Because if you just miss one thing, for example, if an employer misses that casual conversion requirement, you know, let's just say two years down the track, not picked it up, and one employee does, that thing creates a field, a field there of underpayments and back claims for any, any employee in that business up to a maximum period of six years. Okay. All right, so thank, thank you very much for your time and for listening in. I'll pass it on now across to Anthony. Uh, thanks very much, Tarek. Um, and hello, everyone. Anthony Black here from Ansvar Risk, Senior Risk. Uh, consultants. Um, what's really obvious to me as I work with many of your clients across the country is that uh, workforce management is seen to be a serious risk to their objectives. And what I see is much more focus on how workforce and advice on workforce is available to your clients. I have to say that the risk associated with, with workforce management isn't necessarily well addressed and often relies on old views and old cultures associated with that management. I really see an opportunity here for brokers to position themselves better with providing more contemporary support and advice with employment practices. That means going on, uh, going beyond the old, uh, we've got a policy in place, or going beyond uh, the old, uh, she'll be right, uh, we'll be able to manage this ourselves. We know that that's common, we hear that, and we see that unfortunately in some of the claims. What this opportunity presents to you is to give advice to your clients to seek the advice that they require to manage employment practices in, I think, what is an increasingly complex, and as Tarek said, a very ambiguous environment at times within, with, with regards to employment practices. On top of that, we're seeing more employees coming into our environment from, from different cultures, different perspectives, coming with different perspectives. And we want to embrace this, but at the same time, we want to make sure that our clients' objectives are achieved as well. I do have some questions uh, that have come through feedback, and also 
uh, from questions that I've had in place um, from working around with clients recently, and I might uh, ask Tarek then some of those sure. questions. Um, but Tarek, in terms of the advice that you offer, what's the extent that I can expect to receive from employee short? So is it general or will it solve very complex in employee problems? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of the time from 8.30 to 5.30, they can either all call in or email through. The types of advice which we'll be able to assist them with is everything that's mentioned up on the board. Um, I'm not sure, I probably need to get clarification about the documentation side of things. However, any question that they have, whether it be disciplinary performance, termination, they just want to run a general HR question by us, um, we can absolutely assist with. I think the best way to probably think of the services like for businesses which don't already have an internal HR resource, like that external HR, questions you'd ordinarily go to HR for, particularly for line management, operations managers, call through to the advice team. And I think it's pretty important to note that it doesn't matter the size of your business. Yeah. You know, we're all confronted with the same responsibilities. So yeah. We shouldn't expect a smaller two person, for example, business to expect yeah. that they can just manage all their employee practices. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, this provides a, a, an excellent source of information for them and support and advice. We should also note that our advice line is now available to our clients and uh, information with regards to that advice line is on the screen there. So I encourage you to pick that up and also you'll see it on ANSAR, uh, on our ANSAR uh, risk website. Um, I also have another question. I know that as part of the service offering, you provide what's called a health check yep. to clients. Uh, can you take us through a little bit can you, uh, and maybe Julie, could take us through a little bit more about what this entails and, and in fact what should trigger a health check for a client? Yeah, look, when as a broker you visit your client and you want to talk about risks around um, their management liability, but when it comes to employment practices often a client will say, well I'm pretty sure I've got all of that covered, I'm a member of an industry association. And we've always taken that on face value. But without really delving underneath the surface and peeling back the layers, you really can't identify the risk. So rather than be brushed off, employers are willing to offer you, the broker, a really a useful tool. It's called a business health check. Well, we look at the key areas where we find claims arising, and most of the claims arise from poorly drafted contracts. So part of the business health check is that you have a contract review. And we'll take, you will contact um, ANSFAR and we'll facilitate that health check for you. But the contract will give your client a report on where they may be exposed to claims or disruptions in their business. The other health check uh, review is on wages. So this is another area where obviously through the stats we see a hell of a lot of claims. So we can run a health check on their wages. It's, it's really good if they've got casual and they want to double check. They miss something along the lines of any um, increases in their award, well, we can check that. So again, it results in a report. So that's, this is um, a bit of a reality check for your clients. Do you really have your risks covered? How long um, would a usual um, consultancy take over the phone for a client? What, what's the average time that it would take? For a general advice question? Yep. Yep, Tarek's usually... Yeah, so um, yeah, look, it really depends on the type of query. So like you mentioned, you have queries which require the simple in nature and some which are rather complex. So for example, if you call through and say, you know, I've got this underpayment situation, well, that's probably going to take a little bit more time because you need to dive into what is the circumstances, what's going on, what have you paid, etc. So that, that will take a little bit longer and it may not necessarily be resolved um, in the first instance, it'll require some case management. But if somebody calls through, sorry, if a client calls through and says, I've got this employee, we identify how long they've been there, if there's no other risk and they require assistance with termination, we generally resolve those in about 10 minutes. Um, so I mean, that's not a hard and fast rule. Again, it's case by case basis, but I could um, stand up and say everyone in my team should be able to, um, yeah, advise that within 10 to 15 minutes. Disciplinaries as well. Um, because we've got the established policies and procedures there. Yep. Um, you, you really find the calls which take the most amount of time are the ones which um, have entitlements attached to it or it's really complex or there's um, a number of employees involved with a complex grievance. Yep. Yeah. But we try and obviously manage it as efficiently as possible. Okay. 
a question there from Carol. Yeah, we have a question here about uh, if the client has engaged in Foyshore directly already, can they now cancel the service as they'll receive this as an ANSBAR policy holder? Yeah, with uh, the Employee Shore service, advice is only one component that they're paying that membership for. So the answer is no, because um, Employee Shore's service is a whole lot more than just an advice line. So you recommend that they don't? Can't I recommend that they don't. And in okay. fact, we will we will get um, policyholders calling through who are not members of Employee Shore. And through the advice line, we may um, discover that they don't have contracts, they don't have policies, they don't have a good framework in place, and we will be recommending that they talk to Employee Shore about a membership to get those things in place. Yep. Mm. Okay, thank you. And Terry, I just wanted to touch on um, the comment you made earlier about uh, regulatory investigations. Yeah. Uh, or regulator investigations, and, and we're starting to see more of those in the SME environment. Yeah. So could you just tell us a little bit about the support that you can offer an organisation to yeah. prepare for or, or be part of a regulator and regulator investigation? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the first port of call would be what Julie mentioned with respect to the health check. So for someone who just wants, wants to understand, is my current documents correct? That is starting point number one. But more, more generally, or speaking with our clients, Specifically, a lot of them obviously get um, uh, go undertake through audit. So how we assist them in preparation for that is we first of all start with their contracts. So our clients will ordinarily have our contracts and our policy handbook. So we're quite confident that that sets them up for success. But secondly, we still go through and check their wages because obviously if someone's been in client with us for three, four years, we'll give them the federal minimum wage increase. But if they choose to change their wages during that time, without consulting with us, then we wouldn't be aware of that. So we double check that, make sure the wages are accurate, to identify, well, at the moment, do you have anything, any, I guess, workplace risks or um, grievances, complaints we need to be aware of. Um, but ultimately, what really happens when normal person goes into the workplace, they really look at the basics. Um, yeah, are they, are they getting the correct um, rate of pay? Are they covered by the correct modern award? Are they getting a fair work information statement? Are they getting paid overtime and penalties rates when they're required? Are they getting their pay slip within um, 24 hours of being paid? Uh, is the employer you know, complying with their record keeping obligations which they need to hold on to documents for seven years? So those are the types of things, you know, as a checklist we'd be looking at, but then we'd look at other things if we identify any other areas of risk. Excellent, thanks for that. Um, we might just sum up the, the webinar for the morning and thanks everyone for your interest in this. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is more information available in the slide pack um, and also on ANSBAR Risk website. Uh, in terms of the operating hours of um, EmployShore, Julie and Tarek? Yep, the operating hours um, will be 8.30 a.m., 5.30 p.m. Uh, on the Eastern Standard Time. Um, but we do have offices in Western Australia, so you'll find that very quickly we're going to change that to probably 7.30 p.m. because we've got coverage in Western Australia. Excellent. Yeah. Watch that space. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned uh, when I started, the employment, employment practices um, form a, a very major part now of serious consideration in uh, the risk environment of any organisation, no matter how big or small. Uh, and with increasing complexity, change and ambiguity, the objective of providing uh, employment and good culture has become even more difficult. What I've heard this morning is that there's four factors that influence the success of that objective and getting these right is really important. That is to make sure that you have the appropriate contracts and policies in place, that you're seeking expert advice and seeking expert advice on an ongoing basis, not a set and forget type culture and that you have due process in place. What I've seen unfortunately in claims environments is that with all the best intentions, uh, the process has let down the outcome. And for many organisations that's been very costly, not just from a balance sheet perspective but from a cultural perspective. I'd also like to mention the fourth and I think most important point too, and that is management behaviours. And that's where I think the broker role comes into play here. You have direct contact with your clients. Management behaviours will always dictate the success of the advice of something like EmployShore because 
we need to be encouraging a change in behaviour to accept advice, to acknowledge the complexity in which your organisations operate, to acknowledge the regulatory and changing landscape uh, that employment practices can so you have a real role here. Traditional risk management, as you probably heard from me quite a bit, doesn't cut it anymore. Taking on employer advice uh, provides a lot of uh, a lot of benefits to your clients. So you're getting it. You're getting expertise advice over over the over the line, um, particularly around aspects such as disciplinary action, termination, bullying complaints, performance management, and more. Uh, the experienced team of employer ensures that uh, there's procedural fairness requirements uh, in place and, that's the, and that your clients are getting the support and advice that they require. And from an insurance perspective, as we've, as we've discussed and Jenny mentioned earlier, it's provided the clients enact the advice provided, standard excess will decrease to $1,000 for each and every claim. And ultimately, uh, from a risk management perspective, when we think about achieving objectives, uh, this will make for better outcomes, better employment practices and lead to better cultures. Um, so thank you very much for your time this morning. I hope that's been useful for you. Please continue to ask some questions while we still have a little bit more time online and we'll get to address those uh, in the information packs that we provided to you. So good morning everyone and thanks for participating in the webinar. Thank you Anthony. Thank you to all our speakers for your presentation and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. If you haven't done so already, please fill out our survey which is on your screen now. We thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a good afternoon.